part of his dissertation as well. In this way, he would he would know chime to, for instance, inside and out and the concepts for it. Um, and also there are, well, the first thing that we need to do today, is gonna be a two hour long session for how many weeks? And hopefully we can, at the end of the sessions, at the end of the workshops, workshop, we can say that we're all chime to um, users and that we can actually apply the concepts here in microbiome studies and we're going to be very proficient at it. Um, for some of the undergrads, let us know if you have questions specific, especially about the, the scripting, for instance, and how to execute Chime. But what we're going to do, the way we will handle the workshop is we're going to give some uh, basic concepts and then we're going to go through the the um, execution of those um, of the scripts and the data analysis and then relate that with what exactly does those mean what do those graph mean how do you execute them and interpret them so to speak um, and we have some people here from me talks and neuroscience is neuroscience a department? Yeah. No, it's not a department. We are EMCD biology. <laughs> Sorry, oh, an MCD. Okay, it's a subset. It's a sub department or no. a, some sort of yeah. subgroup. It's a su subgroup, and I think we have a few like about five neuroscientists on campus. Oh. All of them are in uh, one is in the physics, is, and uh, oh. rights are in MCD biology. Uh, we are also have some uh, psychologists. Is also. Pretty much, uh, I consider them neuroscientists. Ah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, so our group, this um, lab meeting will basically consist of a lot of people from different groups. Um, a few are in the METOX group dif uh, doing different studies as well. So we'll learn more about your projects and your interest, why you want to do or why do you want to carry out microbiome studies, for instance and how do you apply it in your research. So we're gonna go through that. Um, I can go first. I'm Mary Lou Sison Mangus. I'm in the Ocean Sciences Department. I am, of course, doing microbiome studies in the marine environment and the freshwater environment. I mostly do host associations, microbial associations with their hosts, eukaryotes, in this case, for the marine environment. I do um, phytoplankton. And the bacteria. So we're very. I am very much interested in understanding toxic blooms, and how do bacteria influence that toxicity, or toxin production. And in the freshwater side, my main aim is to um, apply it on aquatic health. So I'm carrying out studies about microbes and how and how do these microbes affect the host under stress, under environmental stress? Such as in, um, right now we're carrying out mercury stress studies and um, how do hosts associated, hosts and the microbiome associations can handle that and how are they pairing with other, um, with other um, notobiotic hosts, for instance, or micro host with other microbiomes that don't have that capacity, for instance, to handle that stress. So, um, so yeah, so it's where um, I'm gearing my work towards bioremediation, for instance, and mostly aquatic biotechnology. Um, okay, so let us, I can see all the participants here. So maybe, Stefan, can you, um, you can go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Stefan. Um... Actually, what I'll do, Mary Lou, is I'll introduce myself last because I've got a slide on me and, and that'll tie into oh, okay. the presentation. But everybody else could could go now and just maybe answer one or all of these three questions up on the screen. So I can go. This is E. I can go next. Sorry, sorry, my, my camera didn't work today. I will make it work next time, so okay. you can just only see my pictures. Um, so actually, we have four people in my group in this workshop. I really appreciate you guys set it up. Um, as Marilo already mentioned, I'm a neuroscientist. And my group is very interested in the, the brain's capability, the neural network uh, guiding the uh, brain plasticity, particularly underlying the learning and memory, cognitive flexibility, and also how um, development and diseases will alter the new, uh, brain network 
and the change the brain function. So one of the projects we studied a few years ago is we got really interested in the gut-brain interaction. That is how the gut microbiomes affect the brain network development and also the network function. Uh, we have a student who is about to graduate soon. Um, uh, Jay is in this group and uh, he started a project to study how early life uh, uh, penicillin treatment will alter the microbiome and also change the brain function. So far, we focus mostly on the brain side. We know there is a delayed development of the brain. There is a um, brain neuronal connection change. The behavior alter, right? Uh, 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 behavior is altered and have some uh, autism-like behaviors. But what we don't know is we have the data for the microbiome. <laughs> Jake collected a lot of data. We got a sequence, <laughs> all oh, the sequence. But we don't know what to do and what is changed and how can we perturb it, how can we rescue it, and how also the microbiome change can act either through the immune system or directly act on some nervous system cells or how did they go to the brain to change the brain development. So I think we can uh, we, we really look forward to this uh, workshop. We really want to play our data to see if we can even see anything. And uh, the, in the future, we are also looking to the aged animal, how does the microbiome change in uh, autism animal and also particularly for the animal undergoing some life stress. It's different stress from <laughs> marital stress. It's really physical stress if they are fooded by other mouse or they are uh, food deprived or maybe they are, uh, the living space is restrained. It's more like unpredictable stress, like our life. So, so that's a life uh, so interest. I will stop here. <laughs> I saw Jennifer's name here. Sorry, I don't know who you are. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for putting this together and allowing us to join. It's really generous of you. Um, I'm a, currently, a, I was a graduate student in Yield Disease Lab and I've stayed on as a postdoc to wrap up a couple of projects. Um, so we study Vibrio cholera. It's a causative agent of the disease cholera. And we're mainly a molecular genetics um, lab, so we don't actually do much microbiota work. So I think we could find applications with like bacteria dueling or polymicrobial biofilms. Um, and I'm really here to try to take this course thinking about next steps and, and next postdocs that I want to do in a lab that does study microbiome um, related to human disease. Um, and in terms of how computers are used in my life, I've always had ambitions of, of learning more about bioinformatics and learning about more analysis and not actually done that. So I'm hoping I can keep up. <laughs> um, and yes, yeah, so I'm hoping that this is going to be a tool that I can use thinking about future projects and writing future proposals. Um, thanks. Uh, so Han, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to join this workshop. Um, so um, I am an assistant project scientist in the Vicky Robert Stone Lab in the Meat Hops department. Um, and um, my research is that um, the interface between host micro uh, interaction. And um, one question uh, we are asking is um, how the bacteria use virulence mechanism to suppress the, the host defense for, uh, to establish infection. Um, and then at the same time, um, we also want to develop um, compounds that would block those virulence uh, mechanism to either treat disease or prevent disease from happening. And one thing that I hope to be able to do is to look at, um, to treat um, animals with those inhibitors, compounds, and see whether those inhibitor, not only, well, first we want to see if the inhibitors work in vivo, but importantly, we want to see if um, those compounds um, affect the microbiota in terms of diversities, or um, is there um, resistant mechanism that um, upregulated upon treatment with those compounds? Um, because one of the hypotheses that we have is that these compounds now don't target um, general bacteria, bacterial growth, so it should reduce the uh, antibiotic re um, the resistance evolution of bacteria. Um, in terms of computer use, um, well, I, um, I minor in computational biology, and so I um, 
but I, I, I am not uh, by work with uh, programming all the time, but I, I do uh, do some analysis and write code um, now and then. Um, but yeah. Uh, and um, well, I really like the, the mission of the workshop and the goal, and I hope that I can achieve those goals for my uh, research. <laughs> um, so I don't think I know many of you here, so I'm just going to call one name that I see on the screen. Um, Samuel? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Sam. I'm a fourth year biochem major. But the reason why I want to work with Kaim is kind of because of the project I was thinking of doing with like either my master's or with the PhD program. And uh, to put it very briefly, there's a type of algae called Symbiodynium that helps corals resist bleaching. And I want to look into engineering an, an enzyme that Japanese scientists back in 2016 found to eat plastics. It's really ambitious. And I guess it's kind of like a mix of bioengineering, but I think it leans a lot more towards medics. So I want to learn how to use Kime so I can sequence Symbionium and figure out how to work with them. Uh, let's see who to call on, who to call on, who to call on. Raina. Hi, everyone. My name is Raina. Um, I am a first year PhD student with the MeTalks Talks program, and I'm doing a rotation in Mary Lou's lab. So I'm super excited about that. And that is pretty much why I'm doing this workshop. Um, I might end up doing something with microbiome studies. I don't really know yet. Um, until this point, pretty much the only, I guess, sort of coding that I do, I like using RStudio to make pretty pictures and graphs, but that's about it. So I'm excited to learn some more. Uh, and I will call on um, Jamie. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jamie. I'm a fourth year marine biology student. I pretty much use computers for everything since school's all online now. Um, and I'm helping Stefan uh, with his lab or with his um, work studying the uh, shift in coral microbiomes after being exposed to local stressors and we're creating a biomarker database um, based on that. So that's kind of what we're gonna be using uh, well, we're going to be using Kime in order to uh, study that change in the uh, microbiome. So that's why I'm in this workshop. So I'll call on Jay. Hello. Um, so I'm E's graduate student. She gave me a pretty good introduction. Uh, basically, what I'm looking at is how penicillin affects brain development and behavior. Um, and I've done some follow-up experiments where I've treated the mice that were exposed to penicillin with probiotics and found that the probiotics were able to rescue a lot of the, the defects we observed. So we think that probably what we're um, looking at is a, a microbiota mediated mechanism. Um, and so this workshop is supposed to ideally help me figure out how to do the analysis to understand what sort of changes have occurred in those communities between the probiotic treatment as well as uh, with penicillin treatment. So, uh, to Batya. Hi, everyone. My name is Batya. Um, I'm a from Dunn Smith's lab. I am a postdoc and I am studying the microbiome, particularly how it relates to manganese and choline. And my goal with it is to link the changes that we see in the microbiome to our uh, um, disease model, which is uh, basically we're studying rats and we have a rat model of neurodegenerative disease. And so I'm looking at trying to link the microbiome and its metabolites and trying to understand the, um, the pathways that link it back all the way to the brain because I was a neuroscience major in, in yeast class. And um, I wanted to learn how to use, I think it's Chime or Chime too, because it is one of the 
most mentioned um, programs that I've seen in the literature and I don't know how to use it yet. So it would be great to finally get some data of my, well, I actually have data of my own that I could use, but I wanted to do this workshop because it would be supervised and I wouldn't just be floundering around doing stuff by myself. So thank you so much for doing this. And I really, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, let me see, let's pick, um, how about Lauren? Hi, uh, my name is Lauren. I'm a third year undergraduate student uh, studying marine biology. Um, I also just use computers in my everyday life, um, just for, you know, lectures and everything else. Um, I'm not super familiar with like any type of like program like this or just like coding or an like analysis um, program. So I'm really interested in um, learning more so I can use it um, to help out in Mary Lou's lab. And just, um, increase my knowledge of the, these kind of programs. Um, and uh, Joanna, do you want to go? Hello, my name is Johanna. Um, I am a fourth year undergrad in Marilou's lab. Um, right now, I am um, studying under her uh, the morphogenic influence of bacteria with um, Pseudonychia australis. Um, so I think that uh, chime could be very useful in even just dipping my toes and delving into the um, microbiome side of that entire process of um, bacterial influences on other organisms. Um, right now, computer usage is um, very basic. I have dabbled in C++ and in JavaScript, but I would think that I would really um, benefit from learning more um, advanced data processing tools. Um, and I would like to pass the mic on to Terrell. Sorry, um, I'm Terrell. Uh, so I am studying bacteria and algal relationships. Um, we've always um, thought of like symbiotic bacteria but when conditions change, such as stress, sometimes the relationship could change. So what I am studying is the bacterial uh, microbiome of algae and uh, exposing them to chem uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons to see if the symbiotic relationship still exists in the event of a stressor. Um, this application has prospects in uh, bioremediation and oil degradation and basically uh, pollution remediation and computers in everyday life. I've dabbled in Python. I've, I've taken the Python class, Intro to Python here in, at UCSC, which was uh, challenging. Um, I, I try to learn it uh, on my personal uh, life, uh, mean, uh, like on personal time. Um, and just have fun with it. Um, using computers, using to make graphs for my dissertation. Um, and what do I hope to do with Chime 2? Um, there's always uh, microbiome analysis is a common theme in microbial ecology. So it seems like it's a cornerstone of any microbial ecology paper. Um, a type of data that's um, needed with uh, that sort of research. And I have had experience with Chime, but I haven't had experience with Chime 2. And it's been several years that I've uh, used Chime. I used Chime in um, a, uh, a uh, what would you call it? a survey. Um, the lab I previously worked in surveyed um, the McMurdo Dry Valley uh, Arctic soils to get a uh, biogeographical um, survey of the bacteria in the area in terms of uh, ephemeral streams, uh, glaciers, and also uh, frozen lakes. And uh, I'm not sure if anybody who all went. Uh, Hayo, you're next. 
Hi, I'm I'm Hyo Lee. Uh, I'm a new student uh, of MCPB bio uh, department, and I'm uh, now in uh, Professor E's lab. So I am a really novice about the chine. So I, I hopefully I can learn more about chine. And thank you for inviting me, Stefan. So next, uh, you. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, sorry. There's... Hello. Uh, my name is Ju Lu. Uh, I'm a <clears throat> research scientist in uh, Yi's lab. Uh, my main research interest is on the structural and uh, functional changes in the nervous system. Um, underlie the uh, behavioral plasticity, such as uh, learning and memory, and also the animal's um, response to um, environmental factors like stress. Um, I, I was initially an um, engineer, uh, electrical engineer by training, so I'm relatively comfortable with uh, programming in uh, like a C, C++, and uh, MATLAB. I've been doing quite a lot of MATLAB programming for my uh, PhD and the postdoc works, but I have no uh, background in like genomics. So I'm, uh, as you mentioned, I'm very interested in how the uh, microbiome interacts with the nervous system to influence the animal's behavior. And I hope to you know, learn more about how to um, analyze the uh, microbiota. Thank you. I think Mike has a Mike is the last one. Um, I'm Michael Kempnick. I am a previous grad student in Marilusis on Mangus's lab, and now. Um, uh, and now I am um, working, employed in Mary Lou's lab, um, managing some projects for her. I am currently working on uh, microbiota involved with toxic phytoplankton blooms in Monterey Bay, um, which we have done some processing for before in an older version of Chime. Um, so I've used previous versions of Chime for that previously hoping to help have Stefan help me learn the new version here. Um, thank you, Stefan, for putting this together. Um, past that, other computer work that I do, um, I run statistics in R. Um, I've taught myself that for use with my thesis, um, as well as just kind of general day-to-day -day work that doesn't involve fancy coding of any sort. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to hear all about Chime 2 um, and am ready to pass this off to anyone else who hasn't introduced themselves yet. Yes, I think we did. I just need to change some things around here. All right. So my name is Stefan Bitterwolf. I am a graduate student. And you know, ever since I was little, I've just loved corals. Um, started learning how to snorkel and free dive at a young age because my mom didn't want me to drown if I fell off of our boat. And now as an older person doing my PhD as a fifth year at UC Santa Cruz, I'm interested in you know, understanding how stressors affect corals. You know, corals are a meta-organism, including the algae that are inside their cells and the microbes that live in and on their, their tissues. And I'm interested in seeing how um, stressors affect their gene expression, their protein composition, the microbiome itself, and also the symbiome or the algal symbionts. 
And one of the main things that I'm interested in knowing is whether or not these changes are consistent by the species, by the stressor itself. And if that is the case, can we use um, microbiome and other techniques as like a sleuthing tool for figuring out what kinds of stressors are in the local environment where a coral might be? And the idea here is you can detect the stress before the coral starts to die. And so that's where I'd like to use these techniques. I am in no way a bioinformatician. Um, so <laughs> I will do my best. I'm still trying to learn all these things, just like Mike was having to learn statistics for his master's degree. I'm having to learn these. And, you know, luckily these fires and the COVID crisis have forced me not to be able to do any lab work. So that means I spent my summer learning Chime 2. And of course, Mary Lou asked if I might teach that to the lab group. And, you know, we figured we might as well open that up to everyone else as well. So the goal of the, the Chime 2 microbiome workshop is to um, teach us all how to design a proper microbiome experiment, how to go through the raw data processing steps, you know, how you could save money by not having a sequencing agency do that, um, classifying bacteria to different taxonomic orders, and then finally being able to do some of our statistical tests for, to see if our hypotheses hold up. Um, the course that we're going to be doing is going to occur over the next six weeks. And this week one, we're going to just do this intro, talk about the experimental design with Mary Lou. I'm going to teach some computer basics, so this is fairly basic. Then in week two, we'll look at Chime 2 itself. We'll do a little bit of an intro there, work on some clustering using some new ASV techniques. Then we'll go to um, all the way to determining taxonomy and diversity from those clusters in week three. In week four, we're going to actually create diversity figures and different things in R. So that's good for those people who like to make figures in R. And then week five, we'll do some independent work and, and we can, you know, all assist each other if we're, if we're lost at any point. Week six right now, we're just kind of keeping open because um, timing might not work out or there might be something that is of interest to you guys that we haven't covered. So the expectations that I've been thinking of for this sort of workshop and the main one is just participating so thank you guys for showing up um, it's actually astounding how many people there are that introduction took a while so <laughs> thanks a lot it looks like you guys are doing some really interesting research that might even be over my head uh, but thanks for being here and then of course the other thing is you know that motivated independent learning throughout the week um, yeah in terms of timing we're going to try and break lectures into like 30 minute sections and take five minute breaks between them so we don't overload. Um, feel free to ask questions at any point in the chat and then we'll leave it to the speaker to answer those questions whenever they think is appropriate. And then it would be great if you guys have any feedback, if you could write that down and just send it to me at some point so that I can improve this for future iterations. Um, I'd like to do a similar workshop for the University of the Virgin Islands where I did my bachelor's degree in yeah, it would be great if I, if I make this really approachable to a broad audience. So here we are in week one, and I'm going to let Mary Lou take over, talking about the experimental design. And then afterwards, I'll go into computers, and we'll do a little intro um, programming in Bash. All right, Mary Lou, I'm going to make you co-host. Um, any questions on that so far? No. Perfect. Oh, I got one question, Stefan. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, we missed a day. Um, when, how can we access the recordings? Um, I'll probably have to set up a Google Drive or something like that. Oh, okay. Just curious. Just wondering. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. We also have the Slack where we will put a lot of the files in there as well. And that way we don't lose them. We can okay. track Great. up from day to day. But the Google yeah. Drive is a bigger file. I'll put file. the links. I'll put the links there. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Okay, Mary Lou, I will end my screen sharing and you can go ahead. Okay. Uh -huh, let me share my screen. You guys can see my screen now? Yeah. Um, it's on display right now, isn't it? 
it's in my computer. Ha, okay, let me. There. Let me stop the sharing and I can do it that way. I think it's, it's, um, that's weird. Here we go. See now? Okay. So I think I've done my introduction and I see. Okay. Let me just, right now I am in speaker view. I don't want to see everyone. Actually, I want to see my slides. Um, and you can see my screen, right? Yes, yes. Okay, sounds great. Okay. Um, okay, so I've already introduced myself and um, I've already, these are the model systems that I, that I use for my research. Um, this is a phytoplankton right here and these are the associated bacteria. And as I mentioned, this phytoplankton produces toxin, and I wanted to find out the mechanism of how bacteria influences this toxin production. Because as, um, as we've seen in past studies, that some bacteria are always there during blooms. And when you manipulate that interaction in the lab, you see the, uh, differences in toxin production of the algae, if, depending on the bacteria that it's associated with. And so, um, so that's what we're doing for that system. And then we have the Daphne system. This is the zooplankton uh, in the freshwater. It's a freshwater organism. And we are also studying uh, the microbiome association of Daphne with, um, in relation to stress. So we found some bacteria that, are, that can bioconvert or biotransform mercury, toxic mercury into non-toxic form. And so when we expose the Daphnia with that particular bacteria and put them under that mercury stress, they did really well. They also reduced mercury in the water compared to the normal microbiome as with the and um, And so, yeah, so that's something that we wanted to pursue. We wanted to look at the application for that in, um, in real contaminated, in natural setting, so to speak. And um, okay. So right now what I wanted to do is actually, because not all of us are doing microbiome studies, so I just want to uh, point out some of the important concepts as well as problems and where is the microbiome studies going into in the future and how we can use it. And so, um, so just, this is just a brief introduction of what are why are microbiomes essential? Basically, we are all ecosystems and the, microbi the microbes are our um, <laughs> pets, so to speak. They are incorporated in all of us, in any organism. So we just call any eukaryote basically have their microbiome associations and we can call ourselves meta-organisms. So if we're actually looking at a particular organism, we just don't look at it in a genomic, in a and it's just in, let's say, that organism's geno uh, genome, but rather you have to think of it as a compilation of genomes of its microbiome and that organism. So all the, um, because as we've noticed, now we have a lot of issues with antibiotics, for instance, or what we call dysbiosis and health-related problems. And we think that microbiomes have something to do with it. We also now um, have been seeing that cancer response of, or, of humans to drugs is different depending on their organ uh, microbes. We can, um, I'll put more in uh, the application of microbiome studies in different contexts later on. So what's what you call precision medicine. So it's a big deal nowadays. Uh, it generates a lot of um, biotechnology, so to speak. And so, but that's something that we really need to understand is that we see an, if you see an organism, don't think of it as an organism as a unit, but rather as a compilation of its microbes and that organism. And what are microbial communities? So communities normally, these are, um, I'll show, I'll mention later that these are um, your bacteria, archaea, prokaryotes. For those that are not microbiologists, prokaryotes are organisms that, or protists, um, these are organisms that are, I, neither plant nor animal, but they have those characteristics. And so they are in our body as well as other organisms' body. 
So those are all microbes. And so we just call them microbial communities because they interact with each other. And they also interact with their environment. So which is the environment? It's either us, the host, the organisms, or the aquatic environment, soil environment, um, even the atmosphere. There are microbiomes in the atmosphere, <laughs> just like what we found in Venus, right? That they are phosphine producers. It's microbes that probably thrive in cloud layers. Those are what you call microbial communities as well, or microbiomes. Um, okay. So what if you compare, uh, some people kind of confuse what's microbiome and microbiota. So I would like to give the difference between those two. So microbiome is basically the compilation of all the genes and genomes of the microbial communities that are found in that particular environment or found in that ecosystem. And so when you think of genes and genomes, it's not just those, but rather you have to always integrate it with the environment. So what is the environment? It could either be uh, biotic or abiotic. So biotic means that it's biologically related. So the food that we eat, for instance, or the stress that we are going through and the environment is the temperature. Smoke can, be, can have an effect on our lung microbiome. You'll never know, right? But those are some things that people are looking nowadays. But that's basically what microbiome is. So what's microbiota? These are live entire collection of the microbes. Uh, so you can call um, group of community microbes in the skin a skin microbiota. If you're talking about their genes and genomes, then that's the micro skin microbiome. But if you're going to isolate these microbes from the skin, you call them microbiota. Okay, but both of them uh, refer to just different aspect of the community of the microbial community. And so some people confuse microbiome with metagenome. So metagenome is basically uh, an environmental genomes, a compilation of all genomes of all the living organ of the organisms that are found in that sample. So it's totally different from microbiome. So um, 16S amplicon sequencing is not six, it's not microbiome, it's not um, microbial metagenome. It's just basically that's applicant sequencing. So metagenome is when you actually sequence the genomes of all those bacteria and not just the 16S. That's where the difference lies, okay? Uh, there are of course a lot of problems and I want you to know now what are these problems. So there's a lot of uh, data standardization just because there are different techniques in data analysis. So there's mother, there's chime, there are, um, well, UCLASS and USEARCH kind of like got integrated with CHIME now, but there are, um, before there are more issues and also different sequencing um, platforms. Now it's being dominated by Illumina, PacBio, they're doing a lot of 16S, um, Amplicon sequencing is in PacBio, this is an equipment that um, sequence longer 16S instead of the just regions of 16S. So 16S is a biomarker, this is for undergraduate students. 16S is a biomarker used for bacteria, or the, it's the barcode that we use, so to speak. Um, there are also issues with DNA extraction. Not all bacteria are susceptible to lysis. So we tend to combine a lot of these methods as, as um, bead beating, temperature even, proteinase K and lysozymes. It, uh, think of it as, a lot of bacteria that have different um, cell membrane properties. And so some of them are producing spores, some of them don't. Some of them can survive under very high gamma radiation. And so they really are very hard to lyse, for instance, and get their DNA out of. So DNA extraction is one of those issues. And uh, this is one of the reasons why when we analyze data, we tend to isolated but are not found on the sequences it's because they're not amenable for extraction or if they are if they were extracted they were found as rare and so they get they tend to be removed from the sequencing for instance or from the analysis so DNA extraction you have to really think about what what kit are you going to use and what method are you going to use and stick with that Different methods, different DNA extraction methods give different 
um, profile for microbiome, microbiome communities. So we have issues with our primers, of course, depending on which region you want to sequence, V1 to V2, V3 to V4, V7 to V9. Sometimes it gives you a different profile as well. So if you're going to study microbiome, stick with what you want to. In that way, it's comparable. Stick with your primers. Uh, PCI and sequencing bias, we know this. Um, there are some sequences that are just much more, they are they anneal more to the primer, for instance, and so they uh, dominate the microbiome um, profile. Um, sequencing is the same thing. So the best way to control this is we use mock communities. Mock communities basically are sets of uh, bacterial sample. So it's a one sample that consists of about 10 or 12 or maybe even six. And these are amenable for DNA extraction. This can be your positive control for sequencing as well as for your extraction procedure. Um, in, so yes, nowadays, back then we don't really care about mock communities, but nowadays because we're seeing all these differences in DNA extract, extraction procedure and uh, library prep, we now use mock communities. And luckily, Zymo, Zymo Microbiomics have been doing this. Before, we used to generate our own mock communities. That's what we did when I was um, when I started doing microbiome um, studies. And But nowadays, you can buy it, which is really great. We don't know how well it works, though. We're going to find out from, uh, from, uh, from our um, um, future sequences that we're going to submit soon. Other things, oh, reference databases. It also varies. Your microbiome profile can vary based on the database that you're using. So there are so far known for data databases, Silva, Green Genes, RDP, and Blast. Mm, depending on which one you use, it's um, the taxa identification or annotation can vary. So luckily nowadays they, they're trying to um, combine, well, they're trying to kind of like correct this by using two databases or training your sequences, so to speak, to, uh, to correct this. Okay, what about number of sequences that does not reflect number? Okay, this is something that I want to emphasize as well. So when you see your sequence profile, you would think that, oh, this particular bacteria is very dominant in this system, in this, in this sample. And this is this equivalent to the cell number that is actually found in that sample. So um, this is always an issue that microbiome people kind of like, right now we're just flipping our hands, like, oh, yeah, it's going to be OK. It's, it's, it's fine to do this. But uh, no, it's not. It can, as I mentioned, there are some biases, primers, PCR. DNA extraction bias. And so how can we control this? Um, how can we put together number of sequences and number of microbial cells? You can spike it in with known low microbial load, for instance. There are some taxa that are very rare. And so you can also use this one. It's, again, Simo has been very good at doing this. And so they've been giving away free samples and it's, it's available and commercially available and you can buy it and you can spike your sample with this. Especially if you are looking for bacteria or a community, bacteria or, or archaea that are in very low amount and you want to know their numbers. It's also helpful for the dominant ones because you actually know how much are uh, of these cells and equivalent to those sequences. There's one issue that they've been seeing, it's number five, it's relic DNA, it's dead or dying cells, but then because we collect samples and they get included in the uh, microbiome profile, although they're dead, they're not active. And, and does this translate the function of these microbial communities? And in fact, they're dead, right? And so, we still, we also ignore this. Uh, right nowadays, what people do is they do RNA, um, RNA seq instead, um, and together with 16S or meta transcriptome, for instance, together with 16S. In that way, they know which ones are the active microbes or microbiota when that sample was taken. So that's something that you need. To, uh, there is one paper, um, Nakar et al., and it was in that paper that I sent you guys. They use propidium monoacide, and this prevents the DNA from uh, being amplified during PCR. And um, but 
it's something that they need to develop further. Okay, experimental design. How many samples do you need to sequence? Greater than three. Three, four. I prefer five, but if you don't have enough money, three is acceptable. Three is acceptable for statistics as well when you compare your, the microbial composition of your, in your, uh, between your treatments, for instance. Uh, always, as I mentioned, always include metadata. Include, the, as we've said a while ago, microbial community concept is always integrated with the environment. It's always affected by the environment. So it's always good to have metadata. So what are these metadata? The temperature, uh, for us anyway, for environmental science people, Temperature, um, solar radiation, nutrient composition, um, chlorophyll. I don't know, uh, for host associations, host associated uh, microbes. Uh, for me, for my Daphnia work, I include fitness and survival. I include growth and sizes of the organism. So that I know the effect of that um, and I can control for it. I can standardize it, so to speak. Sample preservation and storage, this can be an issue. So if you have your sample taken, put them right away in minus 80. And um, preserve, if you want preservation, normally don't, don't, use, don't use RNA later for your microbiome sample, for your environmental samples, because it, it inhibits DNA extraction. So if you're going to use RNA later for your sample, um, wash it with PBS. Um, there's a DNA, RNA preservative that Zymo is also using. Um, I haven't quantified the effect of that on microbiome samples, but we'll see soon. Right, Mike? <laughs> for our Daphne samples. Okay. Yep. Uh, storage, normally minus 80 is always good. And make sure that you put them on... If you, well, for us environmental science people or water um, aquatic people, we put them on filters to collect microbes. Um, I don't know about the uh, neuroscience people or the, uh, let's say the rat people. <laughs> let's just put it that way. I don't know how you collect it. For the fecal microbiome, at least that's solid. You can get that for swabs like mucus and stuff that you can store in minus 80 as well. At least we, we have done that and it works. Um, I don't know about the others, but yeah. Please think of the preservation because the DNA can degrade really fast. Uh, okay, um, just to be a little bit um, in detail about who are the microbiome, who are in there. Bacteria, never forget about archaea. Archaea are also part of the microbiome. A lot of organisms have archaea. Fungi, of course, we also have fungi, fungus. <laughs> and protease, a lot of these protease could be um, pico eukaryotes and algae for some of the organisms like, um, let's see, so seaweeds have algae in them, like diatoms in them. Um, Daphnia have their food, which are algae as well. These are aquatic organisms. I don't know about mice, if they have algae, if they're eating algae, so we don't know. For humans, we do know that they eat a lot of org um, plants, vegetable, but at least it's not alive, but we can get chloroplast actually from those samples. So if you're sampling um, sampling um, the fecal microbiome, hopefully it gets degraded, but sometimes it's in there. And of course the mitochondria as well gets amplified from those samples too. So that's something that you need to remove when you analyze data. Okay, so as we said, microbiome is a combination of the interactions of these microbes with their environment, the host or their um, or aquatic environment or whichever niche that they are found. So it's a theater of activities of all these microbes. So we tend to consider their metabolites. What are these metabolites? It can be lipids, it can be quorum sensing metabolites, it could be um, metabolites that are in the vesicles. Um, so questionnaire here is, are viruses uh, transposable elements and phages included as microbiome. They're not alive, so we don't really include them as microbiome. Although some people do. There are some viral microbiome um, that are, uh, or research that are focusing on this. Um, okay, and when we study microbiome, we tend to include, of course, as I mentioned, the environmental conditions. It's always important. So 
Um, what are, well, I've been talking about interactions with the environment or with the host, with the ecosystem. So what are these interactions? Just for those people that are not um, yet familiar with this. So microbiomes can synergize with each other. It means that one would consume this high molecular weight product and then it would release all this low molecular weight. So it would consume that high molecular weight, but disregard the low molecular weight. Other microbiomes or other microbiota would eat that or consume that low molecular um, weight carbon. And so they are synergy, they are acting in synergism, so to speak, and sometimes they co-occur with each other. And so that's one example of synergism. We can talk about this in terms of one produces antibiotic and so it kills the other, and that's basically competition. And others are mutualism. They can be mutualistic to their host, for instance. They're giving something to their host and receiving something from the host. There's a positive gain from the interaction. Um, negative uh, Parasitism normally is a negative gain. It means that they're getting something from the host or from the other microbes, and they're not giving out any. Or just they, These are the pathogens normally. There are some that are just commensal. They're neutral. They're just along there for the ride. They take up nutrients, and they don't contribute to anything. We tend to ignore commensals. We don't know who are the commensals. They could be the transient microbiome. Uh, and the question is, are they important? Uh, big question. We don't know, honestly. It's important. They are important when they colonize a space and they trigger a reaction from the host, for instance, immune reaction. And that basically preps the organism as it grows old um, for immunity. So commensals are important that way. That's why when your mom says, go out there and get dirty, and we are probably not getting pathogens, but rather commensals. Um, okay, there are also some that are co-evolving with us. Helicobacter pylori, they said it co-evolved with us. Without it, we're much more susceptible to... Um, um, what they call this? This um, I forget the name now. It's like acid reflux, for instance. But with uh, with it can be a mutualist. It can be a pathogen. So with the use of antibiotics, they said that Helicobacter pylori kind of like changed its population and now have basically not eradicated, but rather they um, have evolved with the humans to prep the human gut for immunity, so to speak. Um, I don't know about Clostridium. They, there are some studies that says they may be acting like Helicobacter pylori, that they have co-evolved with humans. And with the with antibiotics, we're trying to remove them. And, or they have been dwindling in population. And so now we're much, humans have much more susceptible to IBD, for instance. So those are the things that... Um, okay, uh, what about... This, uh, if you look at this graph, for instance, cooperation and competition, you can actually look at this using microbial co-occurrence networks. And so the way to understand this is some major taxa, the big circles are co-occurring with some of the smaller taxa and their interaction could be positive or, or uh, mutualism, mutualistic or synergistic. And there are some on the other hand that are competing with each other and so their presence could be either, um, it really is dependent on how the co-occurrence network would look like. So normally it's being represented as red as for parasitism or negative interaction and green for um, positive interaction. So you can do this with Chime actually. I think you can visualize this using, um, it starts with letter C. It, uh, it escapes me now. And, and of course, if you want to study further their interaction, you can make notobiotic um, systems. Notobiotic systems mean it's either with humanized mouse or for my Daphnia, notobiotic Daphnia, or for plants, uh, notobiotic plants. This is really important for agriculture, actually, and for conservation of um, forests. Um, for the um, for microbiome studies and microbiome studies in terms of agriculture. Okay, so now we go back to the question of is there are there permanent microbiomes? Are there core microbiomes in a particular system? It doesn't matter what kind of ecosystem it is. Is it human? Is it mouse? Is it phytoplankton? Is it daphnia or is it water? 
the question here is which are the common ones and are they the core ones and are they important or not normally we tend to associate core microbiome as the important ones and that an organism or an environment could not function without them but i found this very interesting paper where, where she actually broke them down into different terms uh, the, what you call common core and i'm not going to go through these definitions but i want to point out and give you a perspective of this core. This cores can change, so to speak. They could be temporal core. They are predictable components of the microbiome and they are temporally stable. It means that they're always there every time, every date, every season, every, um, you change, normally we have change of season or month to month, weeks to weeks. The common core, these are found across the same genera or the same species, no matter where you find the species in Russia, in the US, in Libya, they have the same microbiome. So those are what you call the common core microbiome. Ecological core, these are microbiomes that tend to be there and they have a big impact on the environment. So let's say by geochemical cycling. We tend to think that flavobacteria say these groups of bacteria, they're the one that tends to use up a lot of the particulate carbon. So those are the ecological um, microbiome core. Functional core. So these are the ones that essentially perform biological functions in the host. So you have to remember that these have co-evolved most likely. So functional core and host adapted core are more or less similar uh, or they are, uh, they, are uh, related it means that when they are when the microbiomes are doing very important function in the body they tend to be adapted with the host and or have co-evolved with the host okay there's something else that i want you to remember as well i just talked about temporally and, and geographic so microbiome can change with time they can change with space Let's talk about time first. In my system, the marine environment, if I sample microbiome in January, they would be different in December. It's because the environment has changed. And so that's something, and it's the same place that I've been sampling. And so they have changed. So in humans, for instance, if we change our diet today, so today I ate a lots, of, lots of meat, next week I'll be vegetarian, my microbiome will change. So that's temporal. Uh, difference if you think about in relation with time. Um, space, they can change as well. So even though um, you, let's say, mice from this um, really, uh, from this um, room, for instance, might differ from the mouse that would be fine in other universities. And that's something that I think mouse people have been trying to grow up with as well. Which strain are we going to use? So for soil microbiome, especially for agriculture, um, soil that have been filled or have been applied with pesticide or with overturned so much or have been, um, have been um, inoculated with a lot of these nutrients, artificial nutrients would basically differ from let's say one meter away where there's no treatment. So that's where we, uh, that's something that I want you to remember, uh, to think about when you do your sampling. Microbiome can change with time. They can change with space, spatial changes. So, um, okay. Mm, questions that we ask in microbiome studies. Of course, the first thing that we want to ask is who is there? The microbiome profile, so to speak. Basically, these ones we wanted to know who are the participants, what and then we go into the deeper questions of what do they do? Why are they there in the first place? So they must be doing something, right? So then we looked at, this is where we use gene expression studies. This is where we use metabolomic studies. And this is where we do um, co-occurrence networks, for instance. And that way we try to gain their function. And then what are they doing? So these are when we're looking at metabolites and for instance, uh, in this particular paper, the other paper that I sent you where they're looking at lipid secretions and which are the bacteria in the non-eating or non-fermented food and the fermented food eaters, right? And so those are the, they found that linoleic acid, for instance, deep, uh, the microbiome of the fermented, fermenting eaters, fermented food eaters, 
is way, way higher compared to the other ones. So those are the things that we kind of like need to remember. So I think this is very important for host association, host associated studies, microbiome studies, because we wanted to know what are they doing and what are their functions. Um, so we use a lot of methods. Uh, of course, don't forget about culture. Culture is really important. Culturing microbiome is really important because we can actually isolate those microbes and we can manipulate the interaction for the host and we can manipulate the uh, the, um, the host with the type of microbiome that we use. Microscopy is important because it it's just a method that we uh, that makes it a lot faster when we try to identify these different kinds of bacteria. Uh, phenotypes, the bacteria have different phenotypes. They have different colors. They have different colony formations. They, they have different growth rates. Really is um, something that you need to think about when you, um, when you do this. Uh, Metabar coding is just this uh, 16S amplicon sequencing or 18S or ITS. Uh, metagenomics is the whole genome of that sample. Metatranscriptomics, gene expressions. Uh, metaproteomics and metabolomics. So these are all the type of studies that are being done nowadays in addition with 16S applicant sequencing. Um, okay, so where do we go from here? Why do we study microbiome? Well, right now, uh, agriculture has a, big has a big stake on this because they, Monsanto, for instance, have been introducing seeds with specific microbiome and they give that to farmers. You can basically inoculate seeds and they grow really well with that particular inocula. Some IBD, they have fecal transplants. And the weird one that I read was the sports people, the high achieving um, runners, for instance, they have different microbiome than the runners that are very slow. And so if you actually, if you do a fecal transplant of these runners, fast runners to the slow runners they <laughs> they get better uh, i don't know what how people will do oh my gosh <laughs> i know uh, it's just things that you do right that they do but precision medicine i think i'm much more interested in the response of cancer people that have been treated with medicines and in apparently people with different microbiomes respond differently to drugs so that's something that i think is much way way much more interesting uh, recently, I read a paper just a few minutes ago, like an hour ago, where they were um, C-section children tend to be prone to asthma and other allergens. But now what they, they this really nice paper, they've transferred fecal material from the mom to the baby and their microbiome basically is the same as the mom or as normal delivered babies. So that's a recent one. Uh, in agriculture, um, this is really interesting. So they're trying right now. We're trying to boost food production because there's almost eight billion people. Are there eight billion people now in the world, or seven billion still? I stopped counting. Um, but I think we're approaching eight billion, and so food production is gonna be a big component of that of this uh, landscape. And so now they're trying to boost um, food production by looking at microbiome. So. And also with climate change, nowadays the issue is, can you grow crops in, the, in this climate change scenario? So they're looking at old ancient seeds, their microbiome, and maybe transfer that to the new crops. So those are the approaches. And conservation for forests, when we transplant trees like mangroves, for instance, or acacia, or any other tree, we bring along the microbiome of that tree to the new site because the the new site doesn't have the proper microbiome to grow those trees same thing with aquaculture they're trying to use that for producing fish that are not prone to diseases um bio they call that bioeconomy basically so yes that's where we're going there's a lot of interest in that there are startup a lot of startup companies about this especially for medicine and um that's where i'm going to Oh, okay. I think I'm going to stop pretty soon, but I want you to focus on this particular statistics that we've been using for analyzing microbial composition. So in that paper, I just focus, um, they have mentioned permanova, perma dis um, dispersion of the microbiome from the center. Um, so think about statistics as a way of 
differentiating the composition of your microbiomes. I'm not going to go in through this, but we're going to admit this in our workshop later on when we actually go through the analysis. Okay. I think I had my 20 minutes. Uh, Stefan, I'm going to give the um, screen to you now. I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, do you have any questions, by the way? That was a great review article. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, good. So, stop share. Okay, Stefan, your turn. Or shall we take a break? Mm -hmm. See you in five. Okay, it's time to grab some water or your coffee. I'll be back.
Okay. <clears throat> um, if you guys could just, let's see, do like a reaction and let me know that you're here or just chime in real quick to say that you're ready to move on and I will do that. I'm here. I'm here. Here. It's it's funny with the uh, with Zoom you can't actually see who see who's in the room. That's yeah. okay. Well, um, I feel like I could use a microbiome transplant right now. My uh, my housemate he's he's able to run for like four hours, so maybe I should hit him up for one. <laughs> <laughs> Science, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did I miss anything? Uh, I just said that my uh, my housemate, he can run for three hours, so maybe I should get a microbiome transplant from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so why don't we start then? Um, I have this recorded in case anyone misses anything, but... You know, this might be a review for a lot of you guys. So as you can, can imagine, microbiome data processing is computationally demanding. I was running one operation in Chime, and it took more than one hour just to do that for one file. Um, so imagine doing something like that for hundreds of files or, or a larger data set. That could take a very long time. So one of the big questions that I've been asking myself is, you know, how can I make my computer faster? How can I take advantage of everything? that it has to offer. Um, this kind of came about because I'm one of those guys that gets really involved in something and like, it's like, okay, I'm going to do it all myself. I'm going to build my computer myself and fix my car myself and save money that way. And in doing that, I've, I've learned quite a bit about how those things interact and how we can actually use our computer to increase the speed of some operations. So this is my crash course. And, uh, that facial expression is, that's real. <laughs> so in this, Next 30 minutes, I'm going to be talking about the computer hardware, just an overview, and then the basics on computer software and some operations. So if you're like me, you see this image and you think, oh my gosh, that's overwhelming. I don't know what any of that stuff is. If that computer broke down, I wouldn't know how to fix it, etc. cetera. Um, and that, that's pretty normal. You might be more of the person who's like, ah, a computer, I put my data in there. It spits out nice R plots that I can show in my publications or put in my blogs. Um, and then you might spend most of your time on social media browsing different sites. Which means that if you're like me, you're pretty much just an old person in a young person's body and you really don't know much about technology and what's happening. But don't worry, in the next 30 minutes, we're going to take you from old senile person to a coding bro. And we're going to get into the matrix and we're going to use all of our computer power. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first question you might ask is, okay, hardware, how do we even make a computer? And you'd be surprised to find that nowadays it's pretty much just like playing with Legos. You've got a bunch of components that you stick into each other and you can create a customizable um, computer system. The first part that you're going to need to know about is the motherboard, which I've got pictured here. This is where all the parts of the computer live. Um, it sets some of the baseline or basic speeds that you can get from your RAM, your, um, your hardware, and so on. So this is one of the foundational pieces. Onto the motherboard, that's where you put the CPU or the central processing unit. This is where all of the tasks are operated. This is where logic is calculated, where it does those mathematical operations. Those instructions usually come from RAM or random access memory, which you can see populating those two spots down there. And then one of the issues, though, with RAM is if you were to turn your computer off, all the data on the RAM gets deleted. And so one way that we get around that is we have a more permanent storage system, which would be our hard drives um, that I've depicted here. In addition to the hard drives, we have a graphical processing unit. This is the device that actually 
hooks up to your screen and allows you to see what your computer is doing in front of you. Um, if you have a really good one, this is great for like making videos or playing video games. So it's not always used in in sort of bioinformatics, although there are ways to incorporate the graphical graphics card into those calculations. And then finally, we have these accessory components like the power supply, the cooling fans, and other things of that nature that will help keep your computer running smoothly. So the question you might have is, okay, how do those components affect speed? How are we going to become the super cyber cat hacking into the mainframes? And so for now, I'm going to ignore motherboards, GPUs, and other accessories, and we'll just mainly focus on the three components that I think most of us will understand. The first is going to be the CPU itself. This decides how fast you can do operations. Below that is RAM or random access memory. This also has a throttling effect on speed. And then finally, we have the hard drives. And so any one of these could actually be reducing the speed that you're able to calculate or process certain tasks. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what you should be looking for if you're trying to optimize a new system. And uh, Mike, feel free to chime in or, or add anything, because he actually built his own computer, too. So you might know some stuff that I might not have thought of. So for the CPU, the main thing you want to look at is the speed of the chip. Um, you've heard this term before. It's usually gigahertz. Right now, it's around between 3.5 to 5 gigahertz processors. And in general, faster is better. The next thing that a CPU has is the number of cores. And so each core is a part of the CPU that can do its independent task. So right now I'm using all of my, a lot of my cores to um, show you the Zoom call on one of them. Another core is probably doing this PowerPoint presentation. One core is probably uh, recording all of this. And so they're all working on different tasks at the same time. But it's not affecting my user experience. So having more cores is better. And so in general, um, I'd recommend around eight, but right now you can find cores out there for purchase of between two to 32. So CPUs that have two up to 32 cores on one, so that's, that's pretty intelligent, that's pretty fast. Um, one of the things with chips that have more cores though is that there's often a sacrifice on speed. So the CPU might be more in the 3.5 gigahertz region, but have a lot more cores to do calculations on. The final thing that I'll mention is the cache or the cache. And this is something called static RAM or SRAM. And what that means is that this is actually um, hardwired onto the CPU itself. And the reason this came about is mainly, I'm going to show you in the next slide, there's a difference in processing speed between the CPU and the memory. And since the CPU gets the instructions from the memory, um, so like the DRAM, this can be one of the limiting steps because they don't operate at the same speed and so they'll miss each other. And so the cache on the CPU itself, it, it takes, takes care of that. And it generally will operate at the same speed as the CPU itself, but its size will be a lot, lot smaller. Um, if you are looking into the caches, then you in general just want to be finding uh, CPUs that have larger caches. And that brings us to our second component, which is the dynamic random access memory, which are these two little um, chips that you see here. These are slower, as I was saying before, from about 1.3 gigahertz to 3.2 being the fastest these days. Um, if you do see these for sale, you'll want to opt for the faster chips so that they can keep up with your CPUs. There's another thing that is generally reported on these, which is latency, and that's the amount of time it takes for that uh, memory stick to, to give out a new instruction. So higher latency means that your CPU is going to be throttled by the memory more. And so if you're looking for new um, GP DRAMs, then you're going to want to pick out latencies that are, are the lower. The one I'm showing here is a very low latency. And then finally, for memory, there's something called ECC memory, or error correcting code memory. And this is usually used for data scientists and, and data that's very sensitive, where you don't want um, your RAM making any mistakes on what it's calling you know, a 0 or a 1, etc. cetera. Um, but in general, for us, we don't need that. Finally, the final component would be the hard drive. Um, I was surprised to learn that there's actually lots of different hard drives out there, and they all have different speeds. So I'm going to be giving you an overview of those. 
the four basic types. The first is going to be the spinning disk. These are the more old ones that we're probably all familiar with. They're large, they're clunky, they're, but they're very affordable. So price per gigabyte, it's about one cent. So <laughs> you can buy a lot with a dollar here. Um, the speeds in terms of data transfer around 100 to 200 megabytes per second. So they're slow on that front. And then of course, since they have a moving part, they are um, liable to break over certain times with the mean failure time being around 300,000 hours. After those spinning disks um, came the solid state drives, which you guys might be more familiar with. You're probably using them right now. So a flash drive, for example, is a solid state drive. It has no moving parts, but it is more expensive. So per gigabyte, it's about eight cents. That's so eight times more expensive. But it's much faster, so now we're up at 550 megabytes per second, which is great for transferring for uh, like faster boot times, transferring larger files, saving data onto your computer in a more rapid way. And yeah, there's no moving parts. And because there are no moving parts, the failure time between these is around 1.5 million hours, so they last a bit longer. But it is a mean, so your, your drive could fail before or after that. The third is one of the newer ones. It's an NVMe M.2 drive. It's also a solid state drive. Um, but what they did with the first solid states is they actually tried to replicate the spinning disk form factor, as you can kind of see up here. They look very similar. They have similar connections. And that was just so that um, people on older computers could utilize these newer drives. Um, but since then, most computers now have solid state drives, and so they've changed the form factor to be a lot more compact, and that has a lot of other benefits as well. Um, it is more pricey, about 12 cents a gigabyte, but now you're getting to the speeds of 3,200 megabytes per second, which is fairly fast and can help your CPU write data to the hard drive quickly. Um, and again, it has no moving parts. Um, I wasn't able to find specific, you know, times as to when these might break, but it's fair to think that they have a similar lifespan as a solid state drive. And then the final one that I'll talk about is the newest solid state drives NVMe architecture. And these are taking advantage of a new uh, motherboard sort of configuration where they have PCIe 4.0 now, um, where the old one was 3.0. So this is the, the newer type. They're much more expensive, so now we're at $5 per gigabyte, but they're a lot faster. So you can get anywhere between transfer speeds of 5 to 6 gigabytes per second. Um, I remember when I was first working on computers and we actually had those spinning drives, those like spinning ones that you put in, they're just like this tiny disk. Those used to take forever just to get data off of them. This one is much, much, much faster. And same thing, no moving parts, and probably has a longer lifespan. Although if you read reports on this, these ones do get a lot hotter, so you'll have to put something called a heat sink onto these drives to use them. So here's just a summary slide for your reference in the future if you ever need to look at these things. And now I'm just going to recommend a strategy that's useful when um, thinking about how you want to um, optimize storage on your computer. And the strategy I like is a hybrid strategy. The first thing we want to optimize is just processing speeds so doing calculations and saving data for tasks that you're operating right now, and maybe even booting. So for that, we're going to optimize speed, and you'll want to pick out drives that are going to be fast, like these NVMe architectures. Um, it's OK if you have an older computer that doesn't have the ability to put these inside them, because you can buy sort of third-party accessories to your computer that are inexpensive and easily installed into the spot where a graphical processing unit might go. Um, and then the second thing you'll probably want to optimize is long-term storage. Like, where are you going to put your data to make sure it doesn't get degraded over time? And this, you'll probably want to optimize costs. And so for that, I'd recommend a spinning disk or a solid state drive. And the thing with spinning disks is if you're not using them all the time, then they're relatively safe. And of course, there's a lot more out there on hard drives and how to properly use a GPU for processing. And I recommend you learn more about that if you want to. For example, the RAID configurations option here video. Um, this is one way to actually foolproof your hardware to kind of keep it from failing. 
so you can copy two solid solid state or spinning disk drives onto each other. So if one fails, the other one has all the data remaining. And then that second video is how to actually use your GPU to increase speeds for processing. And so that could be very useful, although that's I don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> Okay, so if you're going to build your own computer, my recommendation would be to choose a CPU that has eight or more cores. Try to get one that has four gigahertz speeds. Um, you don't need to worry about cache too much because generally that's, that scales with the CPU that you're buying. In terms of memory, you want to get the fastest um, speed that you can find and the lowest latency. And in terms of the storage capacity, I think a minimum of eight gigabytes is okay. 32 is probably better, and you'll want to purchase these in a configuration where, um, for example, for the 32 one, you want to get one drive that's able to have 16 gigabytes and the other one's 16 as well. So that way you have a total of 32 and they kind of copy each other. So usually motherboards take advantage of these sort of two times or four times configurations. Then of course for storage, you'll want to do that hybrid storage technique. And for the motherboard, if you're going to purchase a new computer to do any of this work, you're going to want to choose one that's, that has a high memory capacity. So the one that I currently have is about 128 gigabytes. So if I wanted, if I found out that 32 gigabytes wasn't enough, I could increase the total amount by purchasing more RAM and have um, a size up to 128. So those are things to think about for future proofing your computer. And then the final thing would be probably adopting the PCIe 4.0 architecture so that you can have the fastest hard drives available. Or, you know, whatever you own now is probably good enough too. And we'll just work with that. Okay, so you have your PC, now what? What are the next steps? And I think for all of us right now, it's probably a good exercise to see what you're working with. So what is your CPU speed? How many cores does your CPU have? What kind of DRAM capacity and frequency do you have? What kind of hard drive is your computer using? And to answer all of these questions, I'd like you to go onto www.userbenchmark.com. You can download the software there, which doesn't require an installation or anything like that. And then you can run it. Um, let me see exactly what the time is right now, 3.33. Yeah, would you guys want to do that? What do you think? Doing it. Yes. Great. Um, does this work on Mac computers? It should work on every computer, but I'm not exactly sure. Does it say? Uh, I just, when I tried doing the free download, it said not compatible, but I might just be on the wrong page. So it might, probably is my mistake. I'll that also happened to me. Are we sharing Mac. screens? No, it, it might be a Mac thing then. Okay. Um, Mike, you were it's saying Mac that there was. Thing. It's downloading yeah. a flash. Okay. Um, well, First. in that case, what I might do is show you guys what mine looks like. But you can do these things. There's, there's, yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Oh yeah, I was gonna say a Specky. I think is cross-platform, so you might be able to use that too. Uh, okay, so post a link to it. I might join you guys in doing Specky then. And we're gonna have a little section later where we're installing some other tools. Um, so, for example. Okay, CC cleaner. I think for Mac, you can just go about Mac, about this computer. That's true, yeah. too. Yeah, about you can go Mac. on to about this Mac. Yeah. So just familiarize yourself with um, what you've got, and that could help you understand some things. I'm not exactly sure how Specky works. Um, I'm willing to try it out, though, but... Well, one oh. thing I um, have experienced, if you have a two core, it takes forever. If you have eight gigabyte of RAM, it will take forever. If you have, well, in my case, I do 500 samples, 700 samples at a time. Mm -hmm. So that takes a lot. 
uh, especially when you go to that um, assigning taxonomy. Um, but supposedly Chime 2 have, they made it, I was using the upper Chime 1.9.1. Mm -hmm. So with Chime 2, supposedly they made it a lot faster. That's why they have their own formats, like QZA yeah. versus or QVA. Um, I've had yeah, a student it, with less than eight gigs and it was able to yeah. run on her. Preferably so. if you have a lot of samples, like say over a hundred samples, have at least four cores and about three gigahertz of um, 32 gigabytes is fine. 16 gigabytes is fine too, a little bit slow, but higher than 16 would be good. So, um, and for people that have, let's say 10 samples or 20 samples, it might just work out. Like your MacBook Air, for instance, might work well still. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious, the videos that you shared from the University of Minnesota, Dan Knights, I think, mm -hmm. um, they had access to a supercomputer, it sounded like. And I think UCSC has one. Yeah, to, so can we, we have Hummingbird. And I've asked them to install Chime there before, but I ended up not using it. But my suggestion is talk to the Hummingbird people yeah and um connect with their you can use their um cpus another thing is galaxy you can go there and perform your analysis right okay cool, um, thank you. well when you guys go through all those steps and you can just more or less write these things down just so that you know what you're working with i'll briefly show you what my computer's got so i have Right here, it's telling me the processor. I have a 12 core processor with 24 threads. It tells me the speed, and it also tells me how it's performing compared to other computers that are using the same similar system. It tells me about the speed of the hard drive that I have. So you can see I'm using an NVMe drive with a maximum of 5,000 megabytes, but the speeds that it was clocking were around 997 for the test that it was doing. So it wasn't that fast or up to 1,355. Um, so sites like these might actually even be able to, to tell you ways that you could increase the speed. You might see something like this where you'll have a spinning disk, which is kind of what that icon is depicting there. Same thing, it's just telling you the maximum sort of write and read speeds. Um, so you can see that this is much, much lower than the drive that I was using up here. And in fact, when um, when I was first running these codes from another computer on this one, I was using this one as like a, almost a server. I was running all of them on like one of these spinning disk drives and it was taking forever. And the second I switched to my other one, everything like sped up incredibly a lot, lot faster. And then the final thing you'll see here are the, my actual memory kit. So you can see the brand, the type that I'm using, the latency is depicted here as C16. Um, in preparing this talk, I figured out that C14 is available for this one, and it would actually be better and would have increased the speed, although I'm not exactly sure how much faster it would have been. And you can see the total size that I've got is 32 gigabytes. Um, this is a latency ladder, which I thought was interesting. And I think what it's doing here is it's sending my CPU different size data and seeing how long it takes for it to execute the, the task. And you see that as the commands are increasing in data size, the latency increases as well. And so that is just about the gist of it. Um, if anybody wants to share what they found on About This Mac, please let me know and I can make you a co-host so you can share. Um, just put it in the chat or, or text or say it. If not, then that is something that you guys can do on your own later, and we will continue. I can share mine if you want to see it. I mean, it doesn't have as much detail. It just shows what kind of processor and memory and graphics. It isn't, I don't think I have an option to like run a speed test. Yeah, to... OK. Go ahead and share it then. Okay. Let me stop sharing my computer. OK. Can everyone see that? Yeah. 
So you've got a dual core, so that means you have two cores. Um, mm -hmm. Usually they'll separate that into four threads, so that means that your computer can kind of be doing four different programs at once or four calculations later on, as I'm going to demonstrate. You've got 16 gigabytes of memory. You see the frequency listed there, 2133. That's pretty good. Um, tells you the GPU. And then if you click on storage, that's going to tell you the kind. It doesn't tell you if it's a spinning disk or an SSD. Um, I think another, it's an SSD. Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah, flash storage, it says it there. Yeah. OK. Um, all right. Cool. Thank Excellent. You. Thanks. And then another place, finally, I'm going to share my screen one more time. The rest of this is you can see a lot of this information also in Task Manager. So when I'm running certain tasks and I want to know how things are, are going, um, this will tell me what's happening. And I'll generally click on performance. And it's great because it shows you all of the things occurring at once. So using this, I was able to find that for certain processes, my disk write speed was the limiting factor. And for others, it was my memory, keeping the CPU from going at 100%. And yeah, so it's great to be able to see all those things at once. And I think for Mac folks, you can use Activity Monitor to see that kind of information. OK, and so in terms of, I know a lot of people are interested in Hummingbird, so maybe we'll come to that later. Generally, everything that you're going to learn here should be applicable to Hummingbird. There might be just one more step that you'll have to do, which is you know, sending your instructions to multiple cores or different nodes. Um, but the general interface of like, you know, telling these things what to do is very much so like a Unix-based language where you just type it in, you navigate the same as we're going to do in a couple minutes here. Okay, so great. I hope you're a little bit more familiar with the hardware in your computer and, and things you might do to optimize. Um, for example, one of my friends, he's been working with a MacBook Pro from 2012, 2013. And we updated his uh, hardware by just taking out the old spinning disk and putting in a new solid state drive. And now he's increased his speed a lot. Those older computers also allow RAM upgrades. So he used to have two gigabytes, and now we're going to increase it up to 16. Um, so just knowing these things can save you a lot of money because now he doesn't have to buy an entirely new computer, if that makes sense. So um, DIY, is I'm a big fan of that. And we're not going to do a five-minute break. We're just going to keep going because we're almost done here. Now I'll talk about the software. The main thing that we're all probably familiar with is the operating system. This is the system that communicates to the hardware and starts to allocate different things. So it tells your programs you know, how much CPU bandwidth they can use, how much memory they are allowed to have. Um, it's the thing that allows me to pull up Task Manager and, and run these programs that I'm showing you here. And it's generally the face of your computer, right? Um, what you might not know is your computer can run all different kinds of operating systems, like Macs can run, run Windows now, they can run Linux. So for example, if you have a MacBook Pro from 2012 and you can no longer update your system, you can just abandon macOS entirely and go to a Linux-based operating system. Some of these faces that we all know is Windows 10 being the dominant player. Um, it's not free though, and the software is not open source, so you're not allowed to change anything. They also force updates on you at inconvenient times or, or can cause havoc in those ways. Um, Macs also exist. They're not as prevalent as Windows 10, but they're very user-friendly and pretty great. Then the third one is going to be Linux or Linux, which um, is based on Unix. So it's Unix, and then somebody whose name was actually, I think his name was Linus, I could be wrong. Um, he altered that open source code and created Linux, and this is an open source platform. And because it's open source, a lot of other um, companies or programmers have, have co-opted it and changed it around, creating things like Ubuntu and Debian and other sort of um, Linux-based processes. And so I'm a big fan of these three listed in green because they are open source. The great thing here is that they actually, even the programs that they offer are free. And installing those programs is incredibly easy, as we're going to do in a little bit later. Um, 
And what I'm doing these days is I'm using Windows 10 and Ubuntu at the same time. And I'll show you that later. And this only works on Windows 10 as far as I know. I don't know anything about Windows 7 or older. Um, but right now they have, a, I, I forget if it, the exact name of it, but it essentially allows you to run Ubuntu at, concurrently with Windows 10. Fortunately for us, Chime 2 works on all common operating systems. All we'll need to do is a native Conda installation, um, which is pretty straightforward for most systems. Or you can use VirtualBox, uh, which might be good for testing things out, but can limit your comp computational abilities. So I probably wouldn't recommend VirtualBox as a thing right now, but it is better than having to restart your computer each time to use Chime. Okay, so you spent all your money like I did. You spent $2,000 on getting a computer that's future-proof, and you find out it's only using 5% of your CPU. Um, <laughs> that happened to me, and I was very sad because it meant that all my haters who thought I was spending too much money were right. Um, so processing this one file in Chime 2 took 80 minutes, and I'm showing you right now the, the CPU activities, so I'm just I'm training a classifier right now. This is trying to running. It's, it's actually um, running Python 3.6. This is actually what Chime 2 actually does for you. Um, so Chime 2 itself is in its own special language. Um, it's a wrapper script, which allows you to run different commands. And generally, those use Python 3.6 or whatever the more common Python is. So in this case, Chime 2 is not taking advantage of all the cores that I have, so all of the 12 cores. And that brought me to something called single versus parallel com computing. So single thread computing is fairly simple. It's like that mindset of you can only do one thing at a time. You know, like you can only wash one dish after another. Um, versus parallel computing would be trying to do all the things at once. The so single thread, it's, it's executing a task on one CPU core at a time. So for example, let's say that we wanted to zip every file in a folder. We the first thing that this style would do is it would find all the files to zip, and it would zip file one. After that's done, it would zip file two, file three, and then in file four, and then it would be done. This means that if you have a four core system, or you have four threads available for use, those other three are idle. And so you're only going to be using a quarter of your CPU um, CPU's power. Parallel computing is a bit different in that it uses all of them at the same time. So let's say that we want to do that zip command again, but this time with four cores. What it would do is find all the files to zip, and then it would send them all to each different core to be executed, and in doing so, it would be four times faster than a one core sort of process. And so hopefully we'll actually get to that today where we'll, we'll be able to do that, but I think we might run out of time. Um, so after learning these different things, I was able to run that same command in Chime 2. And so now that same command took only 10 minutes to complete for this one's file. And you're going to see that here. It's going to start using all of my, or almost all of the CPU power. So there you go. Almost up to 90%. And when I go to the performance tab, um, you're going to see that what it's done is it's opened multiple Python scripts at the same time. Okay, so in summary of all the computer things, to increase speed, you want to optimize your hardware and learn the different coding styles or commands that exist out there to help you increase the speed and use more of your computer power. And in that way, hopefully, you can hack the mainframe of this cat. All right. Um, so what I wanted to do here with the virtual cam thing is I think this would be an easier way for us all to share our code. And I'm going to show you exactly what happens when you're able to set it up correctly. So right now, you're seeing all of the different faces, right? Um, if I want, I can now show you my computer just by pressing one button. And so if I wanted to show you how to do different coding operations, it's much easier because all the person needs to do is pin the video and <laughs> and now you can see everything. <laughs> All right, so that that was a nice mirror effect. 
So that's that's the goal. I think it would be great if we could learn how to do that. Um, now I just need to unpin my video. So, um, Stefan, that's basically just pressing spin, right? So if you choose a person, then you can just, let's say you choose me, and then you can just spin my video. I think that can... should work, yeah. Um, the main thing is that what we would be doing is changing um, Zoom's driver from looking at the webcam, from using the webcam, to actually using what OBS is putting out. And I can share you what OBS puts out. Um, right now. Let's see. So I think this might be a good use of your guys' time, mainly because you're going to be doing a lot of Zoom calls in the future, and we're going to have a lot of sort of um, problem checking later on that we're going to do. And this might increase the speed. So this is the OBS platform. I'm recording this for future note, so right now I'm using a camera. Um, but you can do different things like create different scenes. This scene, I've told it to replicate this entire display. And that's why you're seeing this kind of mirror effect where it's going on forever. Um, but you can do other things like record, record audio. So in this case, I'm recording the input audio, which um, I hadn't been doing before. Um, you can record the output, so what people are saying to you if you needed to. So there's, there's lots of different possibilities. But for us, I think the main goal is just going to be setting up um, a scene. So why don't we create a new scene, and this one we'll call Zoom Desktop. Um, so here we have our Zoom Desktop. You can see that my screen is now black, or at least this thing is black. All you need to do to create a new thing is click on this plus item in the sources. You'll press plus. You'll go to display capture, or you can do a window capture if you only want to capture a portion of your screen. Um, I'm going to choose display capture. So that just means that you have to be careful about what you're showing everybody. Um, and you can give it a different name if you want. And now here you go. I am now copying everything. You have the option of choosing the different display. So this is display one for me. This is display two. Um, so you get to choose that, and you can decide whether or not it's going to capture your cursor. So if you take that off, um, it's not being recorded in this screen. I'm going to keep it on for now because that might be useful. Another thing that you can do is actually crop this video. So let's say you're doing a display capture, but you don't want to show everybody everything. You can press the Alt key down, the Alt key, and just drag it over. And now I'm trimming. I can trim the top, trim pretty much all the sides, whatever you want to trim you can, and then I could resize it and make that the large thing that I'm showing everyone. And so you can see this on my video if you're looking or on the desktop itself. And so that is the main idea. Now all I need to do is move this off of the screen, and um, if you look at my actual video, now you are seeing um, a different, yeah, you're seeing Mary Lou instead of me or, or whatever. So I just downloaded OBS for Mac. Excellent. And so I assume that once I um, I can go through, so you can actually use that for teaching. It's a lot faster than sharing your screen. Yeah, the, the difference with sharing your screen is everybody sees your screen and everybody's mm -hmm. forced to see your screen. Whereas mm -hmm. with OBS, it's only going to show your video when it's time. Um, so, okay, great. You've got OBS installed. How do you actually get it to work with Zoom? For that, you're going to go up to um, Tools. And all default installations right now have this thing called Virtual Cam of OBS. So just press that. It's giving you this option here. It says Auto Start. I would have that on. So that means whenever you open OBS, it is going to be um, automatically starting this virtual cam driver for Zoom to use. You can do a horizontal flip if you want to, um, but I don't recommend doing that because it's actually going to make everything look backwards to your viewers. And yeah, this is, this is generally enough. And you'll see a target cam, OBS camera, and that's good. So as you can see, mine is actually started. Great, you've got that started. Um, 
but now you need to actually start working in Zoom. So to get Zoom, this might be a little bit tricky. So <laughs> let's see, let's see. I so question, uh, Stefan. Yeah. Uh, I am installing it, but then it's asking about stream key. You don't need a so, okay, good question. Streaming, this is for people, if you want to do a Facebook Live video, if you want to do a YouTube Live video, that's what streaming is. If you just want to record what's happening in your presentation, that's what the start recording is. Um, so don't do streaming unless you are ready to be a pro gamer or start start your YouTube conspiracy so channel. That's not even a choice in this. You can just um, close the window, though. I had the same issue. If you just hit the red close button, it doesn't force you to choose. Let's see. Um, ah, Thanks. I see. So Thanks, it's already Jennifer. installed, in fact. Okay. Okay, great. So everything should be there once you get past that, assuming. Then here you're going to have... So in Zoom, you're going to need to go to Settings. In Settings, click on the Video tab. And Settings for me were, were here on my face and then here at Settings. Once you've got that and your Video tab open, um, you might actually need to restart Zoom for all I know, but you'll be able to choose the camera. So there will be an option here where it says Webcam. or, or In my case, it only shows OBS Camera because that's the only one that I have. Um, and then you'll see other options like enable HD. Sure, go ahead. And it says mirror my video. I would not toggle. I would just leave that off because that means whatever OBS is outputting, it's not going to get flipped and all the text won't be upside down. So for example, when I press this, um, everything's flipped on my screen and nobody's going to be able to read that. So I, um, it was maybe because I need to restart uh, when I go to my camera, I only have the FaceTime HD camera option right now, but yeah. if I restart, OBS might be there. I think that's that's the thing. And if you okay. if that works for you, could you just um, send that into the into our group? What was that called? Sure, the Slack group. The, okay, cool. Sounds good. Yeah, and there's lots of YouTube videos on how to learn this as well. So in the future, you can go ahead and, and learn a bit more about different things. I found it really useful for me because I have a camera where I do all of my work. So that I bought like an expensive camera for photography. This is it here. And instead of buying a new webcam to show you my face, I am doing a window capture on this camera to show you essentially yeah, what the output of the camera is. So I'm saving, I'm saving some money. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's how you'd switch between those things. And so hopefully you can get those this installed by next class. It's available on all the operating systems, so you can install it on Linux if you needed to. And yeah, I think that's it because we're at the four four o'clock mark. Next next time we meet, we're gonna go through some of the bash codes. So please, if you haven't done any of the practice yet, um, please do that. And I'll show you how to use the parallel command to increase the speed of certain packages. And um, yeah, that should set you up pretty good for, for the rest of working with Chime. Because most of Chime is going to be working in an environment like this, which some of you might be familiar with. So this is my Ubuntu running on my computer. Um, I have a question for the undergrads. Did you, were you able to get that OBS installation and how? What are the settings for it? Yeah, yeah. I already had OBS installed though, because I was using it for projects earlier. What about yeah, the others? I, I got it installed. Um, I just didn't know how to switch like from just like the FaceTime camera on the Zoom settings to like the um, OBS display, but I can work on figuring that out. Same, I got it installed, but I haven't um, configured any of the settings yet. Um, um, will you be able to send out uh, the recording of this so that we can kind of go through it at our own time? Yep, I'm going to put it on a Google Drive and I'll put it in a, a Slack channel and hopefully that'll be good. Awesome, thank you. Um, uh, Stefan, will it be possible to share the settings for the OBS? 
Uh, I don't know exactly what you mean. Like, if I can share the like how I set mine up. Yeah, in order for us to share our screens, for instance, when we're going to go through the scripts, because it's really important. And uh, so, so right now, right. Uh -huh, I was able to install um, <coughs> OBS, but then I'm looking at all my settings right now, and I kind of like skipped what you said a while ago. Okay, then just one second, I'm going to share with you the last thing. And this is still being recorded, so that should be good. So here we have my scene. Um, what's going to happen if you want to use your OBS camera instead of your webcam is you go to this little button here where it says stop video and it's going to let you select a camera. I only have one option because I only have the OBS camera, but you should be able to choose from your webcam or the OBS camera. If it's mm -hmm. not showing up right now, Mary Lou, it might be just because you need to restart Zoom or restart your computer um, for this Probably. to take effect. And yeah. so that's normal. So so in the future, it's going to be as simple as that. If you have a webcam, you just switch. For me, I'm going to need to, to go here, and I'm going to have to switch the scene, um, which is just as easy. In some, you know, It's not that difficult either. Great. So I hope that was informative to you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Thank you. Raina, you said that you have some trouble with your computer. Yeah. yeah. When I go to open it, it tells me that it's just not compatible with my version of my Mac. So, um, yeah, mm. I might find an uh, older version that might work. I'm not sure yet. Okay. Another option for you, I think you emailed me this, is, like, whether or not you should install uh, Ubuntu as, like, on its separate thing. If you did that, you'd be able to use the newest version of OBS. Okay. I did not email you, but I will look into that. Okay. Well, that that's a possibility. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, for no those that either. are that are much more advanced with computer, for instance, much more know-how, um, you can start uh, installing Chime. They have a very good, um, very good Tutorial. instructions. Yeah. Yeah. And I for those that someone is, mm -hmm. oh, as someone who's not computer savvy, even I found the instructions to be pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. That would save us some time later. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Have a great Friday, a great weekend, and I will see you next Friday, and we'll pick it up from where we left Thank you, Stefan. Thank you thanks, so much. Stephane. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks. Thank thank you. Thank thank you. Thank thank you. Thank see you. Monday. Oh, it's Stefan. While you're still here, real quick, do you have any time next week to meet up for the discussion on the project? I do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, does Wednesday sound fine? Wednesday should work. Yep. Okay. Uh, just send me just send me the time that you're thinking for. For sure. All right.